So I'm Rachel Andrew, as introduced, and I'm going to talk for a little while about the business side of front-end development. And I'm going to be touching on a bunch of things, and I've got a whole set of links and things in my slides, and I'll give you a link at the end that includes all of those, uh, so you don't need to worry about copying things down. So firstly, why am I here to talk about this subject? So I've been working on the web since around 1996 as a web developer of various types. Uh, I started my own company in 2001, and that was really a, a sort of consultancy. We were doing web development for clients, and we mainly work in PHP. And so I've been doing client-based work since that time. And then um, about six and a half years ago, we launched a product, and that product is Perch. It's a PHP CMS. So now I spend a lot of my time actually working with web designers who are using our software and seeing the things that they struggle with. Um, my background in, in front end is that I was part of the Web Standards Project at one point. Um, so I've always been very, very keen on open web standards and pushing that sort of thing forward. But I think as someone who's very keen on standards and keen on good ways of doing things, you can get a little bit detached from what regular folk on the web are doing. And that's the thing I've learned through supporting my customers, is actually what regular people are doing. People who don't read specifications, um, who don't kind of make a hobby of playing with CSS. You know, what are they worrying about? And how are they running their businesses? And how are they using you know, front-end development actually in their day-to-day -day work? And the thing that's really come for me from working with the Web Standards Project and sort of through my history is the fact that I believe that the web is, you know, incredibly accessible. It was accessible to me when I first got into web development. It's not my background. I'm an ex-dancer. Uh, I kind of, you know, grew up with the web, essentially, when I sort of moved over and started working and doing web design. And so that accessibility of the web, the fact that if you put, you know, an HTML document together, that's an accessible document. Um, and so anything that we do as developers takes away from that accessibility. So we get to choose. We get to choose whether we want to protect it um, or whether we want to break it. But I'm also a businesswoman. As I mentioned, I've got a product, um, and I live in the real world. And so I run a company, and I'm just one half of that company. There's two of us. And so I wear an awful lot of hats. So in any one day, I might be doing you know, the bookkeeping, I might be writing some docs, I'll be doing some support, I might be developing PHP, I might be doing front-end development for our site or for our product, um, I might be writing a puppet manifest, I do all of our operations. So I have tons and tons of hats. I can't just spend all day, you know, agonizing over which HTML element to use. I'd love everything to be perfect, but often I have to just have things that are just good enough because I've got to ship, I've got to get stuff out of the door, and I have to be doing that you know, several times a day. So today I'm going to talk about you know, where we've come from as web developers, our history, and where we're going to. And I'm going to think about some of the things that I've seen over that time and some of the things I see people struggling with. So to find out if I'm actually the oldest person in the room, um, put your hands up if you developed a site that had to work in Netscape 4. I'm almost the oldest person in the room. Keep your hands up if you work with Netscape 3. Yes, you are my people. <laughs> so I started building websites when browsers didn't support CSS. And I can remember arguments in things like Dreamweaver news groups, news groups on Usenet, um, where people were saying, you know, should we use CSS at all? What is this funny looking thing? Font tags are much easier. So the argument for CSS styling at all was really won on the fact that you could style things in one document and didn't have to search through your document using whatever terrible text editor you had to replace your font tags. That's why we use CSS, it's great. And I started using CSS for layout really early on. This is a superb piece of code. This is the Netscape resize fix. Now, what this did was Netscape 4 had an excellent bug. 
Um, basically, it's CSS um, was based on its own JavaScript style sheets implementation. So CSS didn't work unless you had JavaScript turned on. And also, all kinds of funny things used to happen. Um, if you resized the browser window of a page that was using CSS for layout, any absolute positioning, basically, um, all the um, positioned elements would stack up in the corner. And so the only way to get around this was to reload the page. And so this bit of code was included in Dreamweaver. It was the Netscape resize fix. The thing was, we'd find this lying around years later, you know, long time after anyone had used um, Netscape 4, because, I mean, like, who doesn't want to fix Netscape? So our kind of job back then was we were browser bugs experts. That's what we did. You know, we had these dreadful browser bugs. We had limited CSS support. Um, and that was really what we were doing. We were working out how to do modern things, modern at the time, um, while dealing with these browsers that had very limited implementations of CSS. And the implementations they had had absolutely bizarre bugs. As I mentioned, you know, I was start part of the, the Web Standards Project. I was actually brought into the Web Standards Project along with my husband, Drew McClellan, and we headed up the Dreamweaver Task Force. And we spent quite a bit of time uh, working with Macromedia, who had Dreamweaver back then, and trying to get Dreamweaver to essentially output standard code by default. You know, we wanted it to, out of the box, uh, develop decent enough code. And that's the archived WASP site where you can sort of read the original mission. And WASP eventually closed down because that original mission had kind of been met. Because standard things these days are pretty much being implemented in a standard way, which is what we asked for. You know, we wanted browser vendors to look at the spec and implement in the same way as every other browser vendor so that you could build in one browser and it would work in another. I mean, obviously, browsers don't always immediately support every new CSS spec that comes out because that's not realistic. And different browsers have got different priorities. But generally, when something is a standard, it's being implemented in a standard way. And we're seeing innovation through the standards process. Uh, last week, I was at the CSS working group meeting in Paris. And yeah, I was sat there in a room full of browser vendors, all deciding how things should work, and also bringing their own ideas to the table and the things that are important in their browser. Um, you know, We saw a specification, which is CSS round display specification, which is for CSS on you know, round watches and things. You know, fantastic early stage specs. And this innovation is happening through the CSS working group and through the standards process, rather than browsers saying, we've got this new thing and we're not telling you about it because it's our competitive advantage. So kind of what do we do now? You know, is developing for the web getting easier? Is our job just easy now because browsers work well? Because we're not browser bug wranglers anymore? And there's certainly a lot of people now piecing together bootstrap templates. That, you know, they would call themselves you know, a front-end developer, maybe. But they're really just piecing together other bits of code. So will professional front-end developers find ourselves you know, without a job? Because, well, anyone can download bootstrap. Anyone can just put something together. And I kind of think that this the growth in the number of tools um, and processes that we're seeing is somehow a bit of a reaction to that. Because we want front-end development to be taken seriously. You know, I don't want someone to think, oh, well, if you're just a front-end developer, you're not really a developer, you're not really a programmer, you're not really an engineer. So we want what we do to be taken seriously. It's still development. We're using OO principles, we're creating frameworks, we're creating tooling. And we're creating an awful lot of complexity along with that. And I think we're in some way taking a bit of a step back from the real languages of the web, which are relatively simple. You know, so we're not writing CSS, we're writing SAS because it's cool, it's got variables, it lets us do some cool stuff. But maybe we're not looking at the output that it creates, and maybe we're not looking at that with a critical eye that we would have done a few years ago. 
We're using frameworks that sometimes just dictate the markup that we have to use. Whereas a few years ago, we might have cared a bit more about that markup. And we're using JavaScript libraries that include vast amounts of code, and we just want to do some trivial thing that we could have just written in JavaScript. We're kind of abstracting everything. We're creating abstractions, abstractions on abstractions, and we're making things very, very complex a lot of the time. And interestingly, while we're creating abstractions and avoiding working directly with our core languages, those languages are actually getting more useful and more elegant under the hood. I mean, HTML5 now lets us move away from wrapping everything in a div element, and instead we can mark things up semantically. And we don't need plugins for audio and video. You know, HTML5 video is fantastic. And, and it even includes things like closed captioning. You know, we can add time subtitle tracks using WebVTT to our videos. We've got forms that validate our data with the HTML5 form spec. And we can make use of operating system and browser features. You know, use type equals color in a form, and with a supporting browser, you get a color picker. That's pretty cool. And if we look at CSS, you know, we've got selectors that can accurately target bits of the DOM. And the level three selectors spec is pretty much supported in modern browsers. You can use this stuff. And the level four spec, which is still in development and things change all the time. I was listening into discussions last week about it. But we've got things like you know, time dimensional pseudo classes, which unfortunately don't involve any time travel. But uh, those web VTT caption tracks, you could style those based on timing. So you could fade a caption in and out, for example. Um, and or highlight the line that's been read in a document to the user. There's loads of really cool stuff that you can do there. I've been doing quite a bit of talking recently about layout for the web. And I mentioned right at the top of this talk about how layout was really difficult way back when. And layout actually for the web kind of stopped for a long time. We've been doing stuff with floats and things. Uh, and recently, of course, we've had some new stuff come into the spec and start to come into browsers. Uh, and obviously, this is Flexbox, the flexible box layout module, which moves us away from a reliance on source order, which is something we've always asked for, this being able to separate content from presentation. And I've been doing a lot of work um, about the upcoming CSS grid layout module, which is a really exciting module because it gives us a native grid system in CSS for the web. So this talk isn't about grids, but I think it kind of highlights an interesting point. So if I've got some markup like this, I can set each element up as a grid area and just give it a name. I then declare a grid on the wrapper element, define the grid of columns and rows, and then place my uh, my areas with grid template areas. It's sometimes referred to this ASCII art syntax of layout. You're describing your layout actually as the value of that property. So there's no floats, there's no positioning. Because the layout's all in CSS, the grids can be redefined within media queries. And where the items sit on, on the grids, they can also be redefined. So you can move things around depending on the size of the screen. I've got a whole bunch of examples of this. Um, the site's actually on GitHub, so you can play with it. it. Grid layout actually only works in, it's behind a flag at the moment in Chrome. There's an early implementation in IE 10 and 11, which surprises people. Grid actually came from the Microsoft team. Um, some of the ideas that are, are in it have been around for a while, the template area syntax. But Grid was really pushed forward initially by Microsoft implementing it in IE 10. And it's now behind a flag in, in Chrome, so you can actually play around with it. And the spec's hopefully going to be finished this year, so we'll be starting to see Grid in browsers fairly soon once it gets out in Chrome. It's also been implemented in WebKit. So Grid's something that actually is coming very soon. But the point is, I've been putting these examples on because the CSS Working Group want feedback on Grid. They want feedback on how we might use it. They want feedback on naming. You know, as simple as, does this make sense to developers if we call this, this property this thing? 
They're asking for feedback, and no one is giving feedback. So I, I put together those examples, really, to try and prompt feedback for GRID, because I think it's important. I think it's important that people talk about this stuff early. And I get emails all the time. Oh, well, I'll take a look once there's a SAS mix in. I'm like, why do you need a SAS mix in to play with an experimental spec? And what point is that? But people have only learned SAS. They've not learned CSS, and so they actually don't know how to look at GRID because they don't understand you know, where that's come from. And that, to me, is quite frightening. Especially because GRID removes a lot of the requirement for pre-processing. We're using pre-processing for layout a lot of the time to remove the complexity of figuring out how to do floats and figuring out how to do calculations. And once GRID's live, I'm sure there are things that pre-processors can do to make our lives easier when we work with it, but there's certainly not a requirement to understand it. So at the moment, I think using a preprocessor is probably the best way to deal with layout on the web. And this is the SUSE grid. So this does all the calculations for you to do grid-based layouts without needing to add a bunch of classes to your markup. Do you know when you use bootstrap grid or whatever, or quite a lot of the popular grid systems, you have to add these sort of col and row classes to your markup, um, which is one way of doing things. The problem is if you want to have lots and lots and lots of breakpoints, you know, how many classes do you have to add to your markup? to kind of represent all of those. So as soon as you let to get away from this, it's pretty cool. Um, and there's a great tutorial here which walks you through creating this very complex grid, which is pretty impressive that you can do using current CSS methods. Uh, and it shows you how to do that with Suzy. And you could obviously write the CSS yourself and calculate it all, but that would be hard uh, and time consuming. So, you know, great, this is a good use for preprocessor. So you lay the blocks out using SAS. And then when you compile, you get your CSS with your flexible widths all calculated. Very, very good. But I replicated this using CSS grid layout. And I did that without needing any preprocessor, uh, without any really complex calculations. And that's an example of the code. But the, the full code for that is, is on my gridbyexample.com website. It's actually very, very easy with grid to do these complex grid layouts. And you know, this is the future of what we're doing in, in CSS for layout. And I think, you know, designers and developers should be all over specs like grid. It's in development, it's in browsers. Um, you can play with it. All you've got to do is switch a flag in your browser and have a fiddle with some examples. And yet, people aren't all over it. And people aren't looking at it. And then what will happen, because I've seen it happen time and time again, is it will get into browsers, we'll be able to use it, and then people say, this syntax sucks. And the CSS working group will say, why didn't you say anything? Because people aren't looking at this stuff at the point at which you can get involved, and it is easy to get involved. You know, they're interested. They're interested in, in our involvement these days. So perhaps, you know, we're leaning on frameworks to mask the issues that we've got with CSS so we kind of forget that there are issues with CSS. Because if you use a framework, if something sorts out all of the difficulties of using floats, then you don't think, hang on, why are we doing layout in this terrible way? You know, is there not something better? And so you don't get sort of frustrated enough to try and make things different. So it's only by working with the specifications, by getting down to the metal of this stuff, that we can start to improve them. You have to understand to be able to push the web forward. The web standards movement was totally driven by frustration. We were so fed up of building two websites, one for Netscape, one for Internet Explorer. We were so fed up with having to become experts in browser bugs rather than be able to be creative and do interesting things. You know, we were spending our days just working out why Netscape was doing this, working out why Internet Explorer was making half of our content disappear. That frustration led us to petition browser vendors. It led us to produce things like the browser upgrade campaign, where, which 
kind of was probably a strange choice, but at the time we, we were asking people to basically block the content from people who are using Netscape 4 to try and push people to upgrade their browsers because it was, really was holding back the web. And there was mass adoption of that by web developers. So we were kind of fed up and we used our skills to push things forward. Um, and I think we're in a lot better place for it. You know, there are plenty of things wrong with the web today, but we're not having to build two websites. We shouldn't have to be building two websites like that. So my concern with all of these abstractions and frameworks isn't that they can be used to build terrible websites, because you can build a terrible website with vanilla HTML and CSS. Uh, you can make a terrible mess with JavaScript, and sometimes, you know, libraries and frameworks prevent people from doing terrible things um, because, you know, they'll deal with security issues and, and so on. But my biggest fear is that we're not pushing for better solutions because, you know, we've got these frameworks. And um, someone from the CSS Working Group said to me, well, a lot of the push for layout hasn't come from web developers. The push for layout has been coming from ebook publishers. Because ebooks are, a lot of them now, I mean, are, are developed using HTML and CSS. Um, and there are specifications for, for the CSS for doing print and for PDFs. And they're pushing for better layout tools because they want to be able to do sort of magazine like layouts and things using CSS. It's not possible. So it's interesting that as a community, the working group aren't thinking, oh, you know, web developers are asking for this. And if you start to look at the discussions that the working groups have, they talk about, you know, are there signals from the community? Are the community asking for stuff? If the community aren't asking for it, then, oh, well, maybe no one needs it. And so we don't get a better web. So my second concern is that by taking a step back from our core languages, we're kind of passing the book where certain elements of our work is concerned. So that might be in terms of creativity. You know, we're not solving problems, we're just tweaking bootstrap. And, and it might be in terms of technical decisions. We might be saying, well, I'm using this framework and it means I have to do this. It means I have to put this stuff in my markup. It means I have to structure my markup a certain way. So we're making these technical decisions not based on what the core languages can do, not based on what our browsers can do, and those things are getting better all the time, but based on what potentially an arbitrary choice of framework can do. And I'm not saying that compromise is wrong. Um, there's always compromises to make. To say, we don't live in a perfect world, we all have to ship stuff, we often have to do things in, under all kinds of constraints. But I don't think the compromises should be the same for every single project. And they will become the same for every project if you use the same framework for every project. And there's a lot of sense, you know, in standardizing on certain tools. That's, you know, good business sense. Learning something and, and using it well and build up good knowledge in your agency or whatever and how to use it, that's cool. But I think you need to always take that check and say, am I just using this because we always use it? Or is it really the best tool for the job? And using these things should not be at the expense of learning the core tools of the web. It shouldn't be at the expense of knowing HTML well, of knowing CSS well, of knowing JavaScript. You know, you should be able to sit down with a text editor, like we did in the old days, and build a simple site. And I know that people can't. I know that people who are professional front-end developers, and they would not be able to sit down and build a simple site. And that is really worrying. Because if they can't do that, they can't understand what these frameworks are doing. And it's the same as people learning jQuery instead of using JavaScript. You're learning SAS instead of CSS. Learning Bootstrap's grid system instead of the fundamentals of layout. There's a huge difference between the person who knows HTML, CSS, and JavaScript well, and then picks a tool because it saves them time or whatever else, or you know, it makes a certain project easier, and the person who uses the tool because they couldn't build it themselves. There is a huge difference in those two people. 
These single tool experts, these are the people who get really, really angry on Twitter when someone says, oh, I don't think that's, that tool is doing that in a really good way. And they have to defend it because essentially their job is tied up in using that tool. And it's the same with programming languages. You know, I've, I was a Perl developer and I've worked in classic ASP. I now write PHP and people like to, you know, have a go at PHP. I go, oh, PHP is a terrible language. And I'm like, it works for what we're doing. You know, we have a self-hosted CMS. It's written in PHP because that's what's on the hosting. But if PHP were to disappear tomorrow, I'd just learn something else. Because I know how to write code. I understand the fundamentals. And understanding the fundamentals of what you do is hugely empowering. It makes you know, people worry that there's this pace of change. You know, there's a new thing appears every day, a new framework, something new we have to learn, a new process. And how are we going to learn all this stuff? And in the rest of this conference, you're going to hear probably new things, things you haven't seen. Should I be learning this? Should I be learning grunt or gulp? Or what should, you know, what should I learn next? If you know your core tools, if you know HTML, you know CSS, you know JavaScript, it all looks far less scary. Because if a tool comes along, you can assess it against that knowledge. Will this help my workflow? Well, I'll give it a go. Mm, no, maybe, maybe not at the moment. You know, I didn't learn SAS for ages because I didn't actually need it. And then a project came along. I was working with some other people, and I thought, you know, this, this could be quite useful to help us structure our workflow. And so then I learned it. You don't need to learn every new thing if you've got the core knowledge down right, because you can always build a website. At the end of the day, these things are creating HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And that's all you need to know to develop for the web. The rest of it is just workflow. And it's just you know, whether that works well for you and your team. So these fundamental languages are timeless. It's not so different what I'm doing now to what I was doing back when we first started learning CSS, when we first started using CSS. It's not worlds apart. You know, we've got a whole lot more stuff we can do, and some really cool stuff, but I'm still building websites. So know those core skills well. Pick them up and put them down as, as you need to. And you'll not find yourself scrambling to relearn your entire skills and your entire stack just because some tool falls out of favor. So I've got one bit of advice for newer and younger developers today. It's don't become an expert in one tool, you know, to the exclusion of everything else. Learn those timeless skills and then choose which bits you want to specialize in. So good understanding of these core languages is at the heart of us being able to make sensible decisions about what to use for our projects and what else do we need to consider as well as the tool that we like to use uh, and the processes we want to work with. And part of this problem about people becoming very evangelical about the tools they use because they're very wedded to them means there's an awful lot of noise, isn't there? If you ask, you know, which is the best framework to use, which is the best CMS, which is... Uh, you know, the, the best uh, preprocessor, you're going to get a bunch of stuff. You're going to get a lot of noise. You're going to get a lot of people saying, well, this is the best, and this is the best, and having an argument with each other. And it's really hard to ascertain what should I be using. And whichever you pick, someone is going to tell you you are wrong, and you should have used this other thing. So having those core skills lets you just make better judgment. It lets you step back and say, well, if I was going to build this totally by hand, this is what I'd want to end up with. You know, which of the tools gets me to that point? And with these decisions, I think something that isn't often talked about is the differences in terms of how projects are developed and maintained. So everyone's talking about a certain tool. They're talking about a certain library or a framework. But you don't know if those noisy people are developing projects that are like yours. You know, are they working in a great big team? Are they just a solo developer? It's very difficult to know. And I think that's not talked about enough because the things that work well, if you are a team of 50 people working on a big product, those are very different things to if you are just one or two people, perhaps, you know, working on a project where only you ever touch the CSS. 
Or perhaps you're working on a project where you need to hand that over to a client and they're going to have to maintain it. That's very different from building something in-house. So this is a poll from uh, Chris Coyer's CSS Tricks site. And just asking, you know, how many people touch the CSS in your current main project? So there's quite a spread there of different ways that people are working. So a freelance web designer might design and create a site completely on her own. And then she might maintain it, but she might not. I mean, we used to build an awful lot of stuff where we would build it and we would just hand it over to an internal team and they'd be looking after it. So how responsible is it to use the latest trendy framework or the latest you know, preprocessor or whatever on something which you're going to hand over? You should certainly at least be having that discussion with whoever you're handing it to and making sure they're going to be able to cope with it. Um, it's a lot of the reason why we stayed with PHP when we were doing client work is that we found that that was the easiest thing to hand over because the client could find themselves an inexpensive PHP developer. Uh, whereas, you know, if they had to find a Ruby developer, they were typically, and certainly at the time, were a lot more expensive and harder to find. So it's that responsibility that you have as a developer. If you're handing something over and you use something which is brand new, will it even be maintained in a year's time? Will the client be able to find a developer who can take the work on? And sites developed by huge teams, they've got completely different issues. You need process. If you're working, if you've got 20 people touching the CSS, you need process because CSS is not great when multiple people work on it. Uh, it's not been really been designed for that. So you need at least some process and things like preprocessors and so on, really, really handy because you can concatenate together everything, you know, later and people can have separate things to work on. There's lots of stuff you can do. And decisions can be made differently in big teams, especially if you're keeping the thing in-house, you're going to be working on it. You can make decisions that just suit that project because you don't need to worry about handing it over to another team. You're going to be working on it. So you might want to use something that's really cutting edge because it really works for that project. And that's fine. You could potentially maybe you know, fork that open source project and develop your own fork of it if you needed to because it's just yours. And who's the audience for the stuff you're building? You know, if it's, a, if it's an internal audience, you're building a dashboard, you're building an intranet type thing. You can often make very different decisions there than if it's going out onto the web. You know, it might be that you know that everyone using the application that you're building is going to be doing that on a tablet out in the field. They're going to be using an iPad. You know, you can make very different decisions there than you would for something that's just going out onto the web. It's really important to keep an eye on this. You know, the web and what we can do is changing so quickly. I mean, Flexbox, for example, you can pretty much use as long as you don't have really old browsers come into your site. You know, modern browsers have got great support for Flexbox, and it solves an awful lot of tricky problems. Um, if you know that your site is visited by really pretty much modern browsers, you can use it. You know, the site for my product is visited by web designers. They all have modern browsers. I think we've got like 97% of visitors have got a browser which is capable of using modern Flexbox. It's not the case for the actual product itself because the product admin is used by end clients editing their websites. And so some of them might have Internet Explorer 8. So we can't use it there. Really important to look at what's been what is coming to the site so you can choose the technology well. But also, what time have we got available? Can we carefully handcraft something? You know, does that matter? Or, you know, do we have to work out how we can really, you know, use tools to give us a bit more time? But when it comes to time, whose time are we actually saving? I think we're very, very keen as developers to optimize our time, to make things quick to code, to, you know, sort of optimize our experience as the person developing the site, and sometimes that's at the expense of users. Because we're the wrong thing to optimize if you've got a choice. Because we write code once, and then it's run thousands and thousands and thousands of times in the browsers of our users. So if that optimization that saves you a bit of time causes the site to crawl, 
causes everyone to have a terrible experience, causes people you know, on mobile not to be able to download it, that's not a good optimization. And so that we need to be very careful about looking at these tools and saying, OK, this saves me masses of time. It's great. But it, are we optimizing in the right place by using them? Um, old standards nerds have good thoughts on this. Uh, this is Aaron Gustafsson. He's another web standards veteran. And he's as worried as I am about this trend to make developers' lives easier uh, rather than those of our users. And this increasingly matters with so many people now accessing the web on mobile around the world. There's a real business case to be made for making your site very accessible on limited devices and unlimited bandwidth. So this is a slide from We Are Social's Compendium of Global Digital Statistics. And it's really worth taking a look at if you need to convince anyone in your company why this stuff matters. So there are parts of the world where the majority of web use is mobile. And when we're talking mobile, we're not talking about like our use of mobile, which might be the latest iPhone on a fast connection. We're talking about feature phones um, on slow connections, and very limited data. And that's the only way a lot of people are actually accessing the web. So this is what it comes down to. You know, if using that shortcut, using the plugin or the framework is not going to impact the people who use the website or application, if it's not going to cause huge accessibility problems, if it's not going to cause huge downloads on mobile, then for me, you know, go for your life. Because it's not causing anyone a problem. But if it will, if the only way to get the all singing, all dancing application that you've sort of got in your head is to make these huge compromises, then maybe you need to look at another way of getting to the end result. And we often try and kind of justify our shortcuts by saying, oh, this is only temporary. You know, this site will be replaced. You know? And I don't know, but I did a lot of client work and I built lots of things that I was promised were going to be, you know, temporary. And you look back five years later and there it is. Usually still with the same content as well, you know? But things aren't as temporary as, as uh, sometimes we think they'll be on the web. You know, and also, sometimes you end up maintaining that temporary thing forever because once it's up there, they're like, well, it's all right, it works. You know, we don't, we don't need to update that. And so you end up maintaining this dreadful, crufty thing on an out-of-date framework or, you know, an out-of-date library forever because there's no money to fix it. And, you know, this stuff matters to me. I've always chosen to protect the inherently accessible nature of the web because I believe the web is for everyone. And that's for the person in the country that, you know, where they're using a feature phone and they've got very, very limited internet connectivity and they're using the web to, to learn and to expand their horizons and to build their business, you know, from that phone. I think that's really, really important. It's important that we all get to use the web um, and all of us worldwide. I think it's hugely empowering. It's, uh, it's been incredibly empowering in my life. You know, I, I got into the web when I, I was next down, so I didn't have any other skills, and I started teaching myself web development. And it's been huge in my life, you know, my ability to, to make a living. And I think it can be for so many other people. So the best way I know to protect the web is still this term progressive enhancement. That's at the heart of these choices. It's at the heart of the choices that I make. This quote is from the BBC Future Media Standards and Guidelines. These state that the core experience of every document should not require JavaScript or even CSS to function. And that's where we start with progressive enhancement. We start with structured HTML. And I've, I've traveled quite a lot. And I'm always on like terrible hotel Wi-Fi. And it's when you're on terrible hotel Wi-Fi that you realize how terrible the web is. And like you load these pages and nothing loads. You know, I was trying to find the, the details of the restaurant last night and all I could get was a black web page. Because it was all images and fonts and none of it loaded. Whereas if you start with very basic HTML and you make sure that doesn't happen, at least I could have, oh, I would have got the markup, I would have, you know, I would have got something, I could have at least found where it was. 
um, just from reading the plain HTML. So we start with well-structured HTML, and then we layer on the experience for those users and user agents that can support it. I think we think of progressive enhancement as being this thing that happens in the browser. You know, we've built a progressively enhanced site, and therefore, you know, we start with the HTML and we add on all the other bits. But I think it's, it's deeper than that. It's at the heart of our processes. It happens right through the stack. And when we're talking about the business of what we do, you know, what's the core experience? What is the core experience that your site or your app needs to provide? There's rarely a business case for kind of bling and for showing off. Um, you know, I was talking earlier this week at a business conference. The things that build businesses are not flashy websites. Not at all. So that kind of matters less than you think. So what is the core experience that you need to deliver through your app, through your website? Instead of looking for a magic tool that gives you an all-seeing, all-dancing UI, but only with one day work, we can develop a basic but usable thing first and ship it and then add to it. It might not have every possible feature at the start, but it works and it's accessible. So we ship things and then we iterate. And we're iterating on a solid base. We're not throwing up something that looks amazing and promises a lot, but then just doesn't work. And then we're kind of having to fix all the bugs in that because it works poorly on mobile or it locks out users of assistive technology. And then we're kind of backtracking and saying, oh, yes, accessibility is coming. Accessibility should never be coming. That should start. That should be at the core. And that's kind of how we approach the purchaser interface. Now, Perch is downloadable. It's like WordPress. You download it. So actually getting people to upgrade is kind of hard because they've then got it, and you have to kind of encourage them to up upgrade. But we focus a lot of effort on the admin experience because I think that content editors, a lot of the time, are kind of the forgotten users of websites. We worry about the, the, the web pages on the front end, and we worry about us as developers, and the people editing the content are kind of like, yeah, we've got this awful CMS to use, you know. So we try and get away from that. So obviously, we care a lot about admin UI. So it was very tempting for us to want to create you know, a really snazzy JavaScript UI and do all sorts of clever tricks. And we launched Perch six years ago, and we've continued to iterate. And we do use JavaScript in our UI, because some things are enhanced by it, like assets management and so on. Yet the whole experience works without JavaScript, because that's what we started with. We started with this very plain user interface that just worked. It all works without JavaScript. And one of the things we love is every now and again, we'll have someone drop us a line, and they'll say, oh, you know, I delivered this site with Perch to, to an organization. And then they told me they've got a user who needs to use the CMS who uses a screen reader. And I was really worried, because these things don't normally work with screen readers, but they're telling me how great it is. Now, to me, that, that is a win. If someone with a screen reader can use our stuff without us, we've never tested it with a screen reader. Um, I'd love to do full-scale accessibility testing on it, but we haven't as yet. But because we've built it in a progressively enhanced way, someone with a screen reader can use our software. And we kind of got that for free, essentially, just by doing things the right way. And I love the fact that despite the fact that we, there's two of us and we're trying to do a million things, by working in a good way, we managed to do that, and I think that's really cool. But what about all those third-party plugins, frameworks, and so on? So how do they fit in? They're not all bad. Um, how do we sensibly combine them with our work? Now, I imagine that most people here understand this idea of not invented here syndrome. This is the idea that programmers will reject any solution that isn't developed in-house. And you get this leveled at you. If you build something that's different to what is already out there, you know, and there's another, there's another way of solving that problem, people will say, you're reinventing the wheel. Why are you doing that? And sometimes that's true. In fact, I've got, there's a strange thing that goes on, whereas the less I know about the subject, the more I am likely to write my own terrible code to solve the problem. It's like, you know, it, it, we all do it. We all try and reinvent the wheel. But I think there's a flip side we can end up so reliant on third-party solutions that we stop innovating. 
We stop thinking creatively around our problems. We just reach for the nearest plug-in. We search for something that does more or less what we need. And to be honest, to me, the best thing about this job is the creativity, is the creating cool stuff, not just, you know, cobbling together stuff that other people have written. So if you find some framework or plug-in and it kind of fits the bill and you're really busy and you need to get something shipped, you think, well, we'll use this now and we'll replace it later. And that's actually a decent way to work, isn't it? You can say, well, let's use this and we know we want to do something better, but we can use this for now. So what you want to do then is to avoid that plugin becoming a dependency in your project. You know, avoid basing, basing great chunks of your workflow on a third party tool because that might change. It might change in a way that's not useful for you or you might discover that it has some major problem on mobile or accessibility or whatever. So don't base great chunks of your app on some third party tool. The dependency inversion principle works really well here. The first of these two principles is most relevant to those of us on the front end. High level modules should not depend on low level modules. Both should depend on abstractions. And if we go back to the early example of the SUSE grid, that's a reasonable example of a front end shortcut that doesn't create a dependency. Because we don't need to add anything to our markup or content if we use SUSE. We end up with CSS when we use SUSE. So we could remove the SUSE grid, or we could remove the SAS part of the tool chain completely, and we'd still end up with semantic HTML and CSS. So that seems like a really good way to use a tool. It's there, we've used it, it's, it's shortcut the difficulty of creating layout on the web, but we can pull it out of the, of the workflow and our site still runs, it's absolutely fine. And I think a progressively enhanced approach is a good example of this dependency inversion in as much as it applies to front-end development. You might have a JavaScript implementation that hijacks regular HTML5 video and adds some stuff. A static map is hijacked by a draggable and zoomable map. A form interface that allows you to save and add another and you're using, using JavaScript to really just post to the browser but you could just have, you know, people would post and then the next one would appear and post. That would still work without the JavaScript. We can do this stuff. We can work in a progressively enhanced way. And then if for some reason the JavaScript doesn't load, and ultimately, you know, everyone is a user without JavaScript until the JavaScript's loaded, and it might not load, um, it all still works. And I know when you're pushed for time, it is very, very tempting just to get things together the quickest way you know how. And you sort of think, well, if I can't do everything, if I can't make this perfect, why am I bothering doing anything at all? But I think any steps you take towards progressive enhancement are going to be beneficial to someone. So do the things that you can do with the time that you've got. This is a great post, Jason Garber. He wrote some really excellent and sensible posts about the practical application of progressive enhancement with this understanding that what we do is on a continuum. It's not terrible and perfect. It's kind of like, you know, we're all on different levels of that. And the sites that I build are all on different levels of that. So to recap, learn and importantly teach other people these core skills, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. Please maintain an interest in emerging specifications and make sure that you don't end up clinging to outdated abstractions because you've become so reliant upon them. There's absolutely a place for the expert front-end developer. Instead of learning how to cope with browser bugs though, you know, become an expert on performance. As web usage goes more and more mobile, that's going to become more and more important. You know, becoming an expert in making well-performing applications is going to be incredibly important in the future. When making decisions about these frameworks, plugins, and systems, ask yourself, is the output as good as if you'd written it by hand? Or how close can you get to that? Is this tool just speeding things up? And if it isn't, you know, what are the compromises? And are there compromises you're happy to make? While there's a ton of great code to draw on out there, and I'm sure a lot of you are writing that code and, and making it public, try and avoid in re sort of inventing the wheel. And make sure that doesn't prevent you from creating your own new things.
The role of this expert front-end developer hasn't gone away, and I think it's so much more than it was 10 years ago. We're incredibly fortunate, and we have the ability to really change the way people use digital products, to how they interact with things, and how they interact with each other online. And there's so much that we can do and make, and there's so much more around the corner. So don't stop playing and don't stop experimenting and pushing things forward because we've come so far in the last few years. Um, I might be, you know, I've been doing this since the year dot, but I am still really, really enthusiastic and interested in front-end development as, as kind of a craft and what we can do. I'm excited about the next 10 years. Uh, I'm excited about where we'll go with this. So thank you so much for listening. I really hope you enjoy the next couple of days. There's some great stuff coming up. My slides and a load of links are available at that URL, and I'm hanging around, so I'll be very happy to have a chat with anyone if you'd like to. Thank you.